We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. still had to wear the West Virginia polo in honor of the game we were supposed to be going to this weekend. We were going to go to West Virginia, Texas. We're going to take the five and a half hour drive to Morgantown. But with both teams being, for lack of better phrasing, ass, yeah, it made more sense to skip this trip and potentially go to SMU Cincy and see that game in Cincinnati. Better game, 13 point spread. I'm more, I think that game's gonna be better than Texas, West Virginia. More people will be paying attention to that game. So I'm happy we're staying in town. A little bigger implications yeah. in that game. And yeah, I, I think I think it's for the best. Sadly, West Virginia, Texas, Charleston's gonna be a stop on the tour at some point. But this year, the cards were not aligned. Not Card, aligned. Stars. Stars not aligned. Cards, cards were not weren't aligned either. Though. In the deck? I don't even know. You're done. You're done. You're done with the phrases. Let's get to... Yeah, can we catch an early buzz? You got anything to buzz on? What's the buzz lately? Got any fire? We should have talked about this before the podcast. No, that's true. Like I guess this. I was interested to know if you had any buzz laying around. I can't think of any like fun to reads lately or any notable news, right? I mean, Le'Veon Bell release, I guess we already talked about that. Mel Tucker nearing a $95 million extension. Did you do any prep for this podcast, Austin? Or uh, we just, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then fuck it. No catch an early buzz. Patriots at Falcons. Thursday Night Football. How's this for a buzz? Green Line sees value on Atlanta. Atlanta plus seven at home. And, but 85% of the cash bet on this game so far is on New England minus seven. My immediate thoughts. New England Patriots are fucking on a roll right now. Mac Jones is the highest graded rookie quarterback we've ever seen in weeks one through 10. And over the past five weeks, this offense ranks number two in EPA per play. Falcons are not just bottom five in EPA per play on offense, but they're also bottom five um, in EPA per rush. I mean, this is not a good Falcons team, and that's evident in this Falcons plus seven line. And honestly, I don't want to be the side that's betting Atlanta here. If this got to seven and a half, it's a home dog that's more than a score. Like that seven and a half, that eight point line, that feels a little bit too much for me. But honestly, New England minus seven, they're hot. I think they roll. I like the minus seven. Yeah. This is obviously, I mean, if you just base it off of what we saw last week, when it was New England blows out one of the better teams in the SC and the Browns, the Falcons just get rolled by the Cowboys. It's like stars aligning, teams heading off the directions. Aligning. But even still, even like taking it back a step, breathing, thinking rationally that they won't, each team will, you know, regress towards the mean this upcoming week. I still think the matchups really favor New England, especially with a fully healthy offensive line against this defensive line, one of the least physical defensive lines in all the NFL. And the Falcons have turned into this sort of cover two defense and Mac Jones and his strength of throwing underneath hitting guys in that area of the field I, that plays well against cover two like it, to beat these Patri this Patriots team I think you need to be able to play a little man coverage and that's not the Falcons bread and butter because that, that's you know the Patriots don't have natural separators in that receiving core so yeah that's my take I think I still like the Patriots cover seven you also have Cordero Patterson battling an ankle sprain. I think he is best running back in the NFL. Best part. running back in the NFL. And then the other part, too, is you even talk about the Patriots defense. Patriots defense is top three in EPA per play allowed, not just over the past five weeks, but over the past 10 weeks. They have been phenomenal on that wow. side of the ball. I think they're finding it. They, the New England Patriots are finding it and hitting their stride. I think that shows up on Thursday night. Short week, I give the advantage to Belichick, Patriots, Mac Jones. Colts at Bills for kicking off the one o'clock slate here. Bills favored by seven, another seven point line. Now, Green Line sees value in the dog. It's a road dog, yet 67% of the cash bet on this game already is on the Bills. I would argue that both these teams are kind of hot. You know, Josh Allen coming off the best game of this season so far. He's had the highest grade he's had in any single game this year. Indy over the past five weeks, number one in EPA per rush. But then you look at his Buffalo defense most efficient defense on stopping the run and most efficient defense overall as well. Like Buffalo 
his hitting their stride on the defense side of the ball. I don't know. I don't know if Jonathan Taylor goes off here. And if Jonathan Taylor goes off, I don't think this Colts offense goes off. I like, again, and I, two seven-point favorites, and I'm leaning both ways, but I still feel good about the Bills here, especially at home. Yeah, the, the Colts have been very, one, very dependent on that running game rolling of late. I don't foresee that happening against the Bills. And two, very dependent on either PIs or big plays in the passing game. And it's like the Bills have the lowest passer rating allowed on throws with 10-plus air yards in the NFL this season. They have not let teams create explosive plays on them. So if they can stop the run not and disallow, disallow, stop explosive plays, I like that. I think those both work. That's like you're shutting down the Colts offense then. Mm, that's maybe a little too far. Not but yes, sure. I like the Bills covering seven in this game. And you were on Patriots too, right? So Patriots minus seven, Covering Bills minus seven. Here. AFC East getting some love. Ravens at Bears. The Bears stink. Mm. They're, they're bottom five and efficiency on both offense and defense in the last five weeks. Yet, another dog, another value on Green Line. Green Line likes value, likes the home dog at six. But again, the public is on the other side. The public is on the Ravens betting them at minus six. 60% of the cash bet on this game on Baltimore. I am buying the Ravens another favorite on the lower end of the market, right? Like they are coming off a loss against Miami that no one saw coming. I don't think the Bears, even if they tried their hardest, could put up a defensive performance that the Dolphins did against Lamar Jackson. Like, I don't think that's going to happen. They are at home, coming off a bye. Maybe you lean into them, watching that Dolphins tape a thousand times and finding a way. I just don't think they have it. Like, they're 31st in the EPA allowed per pass. I think this is the week rookie Rashad Bateman goes over 100 yards and leads this Ravens offense to a comfortable win. I win that clear six. I, I like the Ravens because of the matchup against Fields. And Fields against the Blitz this year. And even dating back to his time at Ohio State. Now, obviously, a little better. Fared a little bit last week against the Steelers. But still, he's been sacked on 11 of his 85 blitz dropbacks. That's the highest rate of any quarterback in the NFL in terms of converting blitz dropbacks into sacks as a grade in the 50s versus blitzes. And Ravens, fifth most blitz, fifth blitz heaviest team in the NFL. That is what they do. So I just think that's a bad matchup. Fair enough. I think we were on three consecutive favorites. We got to find a dog we like, and why not start? You Lions. were on the Falcons, I thought, in the first one. I was on Patriots, I said. Oh. Well, I took Pats. All right. Pats, Bills, Ravens, Lions at Browns. Maybe this is where we find the dog. No Kareem Hunt. I don't think Nick Chubb is expected to play. And without those guys and without OBJ, I do think that this nine and a half point line might be a bit big. I'm buying Detroit, especially if it gets to 10. However, there is that injury now, right? With the, the I think it's the dominant for Jared Goff. And if Tim Boyle plays this fucking game, I'm not touching the Detroit Lions at nine and a half. And I think if Tim Boyle does play, it could get to 10, 10 and a half, 11. I reserve the right. If Jared Goff suits up, I like them nope. at plus yeah, nine and a half. Nope. No, no. Can tell, can I reserve that. the right. I reserve the right. Jared Goff plays. I like Lions plus nine and a half. Jared Goff canceled. doesn't. I take Cleveland and whatever number they throw my way. Okay. All right. I I still like Cleveland in this one. Nine and a half. I'm going, I'm going heavy on the favorites. I don't give a shit. I'm going nine and a half. Browns bounce back because their running game will move the ball in the Detroit Lions run defense. You got rookies up the middle at defensive tackle for them uh, and at linebacker. You're... I, I just do not foresee them being able to they're in the bottom 10 right now and run defense grade as a team and if again that is what it takes for the cleveland browns to kind of hide baker mm -hmm. is to have a game script that says we can run the ball at any given time like that and then they can because they're that damn good up front so i think that to me biggest matchup of the game and again if if the golf is teetering on the edge that makes me even like the browns even more yeah maybe i'm wrong to even smell the lines here I don't even know. I, I I want I, I want to say, you know, Baker Mayfield also is not like you know a, a clean bill of health here either, right? And if Baker, he has like six different injuries, yes. Uh, but it's like that's not they don't win because of him, though. So, you yeah, know, they win because of Dearness Johnson. The Lions also just line. like don't win. So true. No, the Lions <laughs> also struggle to win football games. All right, Texans at Titans. I like the Titans and the points. This is a hold your breath and take it for me. I I, I don't see. The, the Houston Texans on the road against the Titans covering 10. And I think if Derrick Henry was here, they'd probably have this line at 11, 12, or whatever. Like, just 10 over, a, you know, a bottom two team in the NFL, bottom three team in the NFL. I'm all in on, on the Tennessee Titans. Yeah, I promise I'm not going to take all faves this week, but this is, some, this is the <laughs> hold-your-nose special this week. I mean, the Texans are the hold-your-nose special 
opponent. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's they've been featured on this like four different times this year because yeah. every spread's double digits and every time no one feels good about them actually covering. Um, so yes, I am with you on that one. All right. Before we get to Packers at Vikings, you know what I got to bring up? My favorite new chair, the X chair. Introducing a new tailgate sponsor, X chair. Working from home is more important now than ever. Optimize your home office with an X chair and our many accessories to enhance your focus, productivity, energy, and comfort. Once you feel the customized support of X chair's patented dynamic variable lumbar or DVL, there's no going back. I, I've been on this podcast and I've had some takes. The X chair is objectively the best chair I've ever sat in in this office. Have I sat in some other really nice chairs? Maybe some luxurious massage chairs, sure. But if for an office chair, this thing can't be beat. I mean, this thing's next level, absolutely next level. It's all in the LMX massage and temperature regulation, exclusively designed and made for X chair. With versatile comfort and extraordinary design, X chair fits any space, high performance, quality engineering, and extreme comfort. Those are all the reasons I love my X chair. Now I can't wait to be at work. And sometimes, even if I'm not working, I sit in the X chair. I sometimes Snapchat you from it. Snapchat you just the back of the chair. Your Snapchat game stinks. My Snapchat game stinks, but the X chair doesn't. Try the X chair for yourself, risk free for 30 days. Go to xchairtailgate.com. That's now letter X chair, T A I L G A T E.com, or call 1 844 4X chair for $100 off your first order. X chair has a 30 day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. xchairtailgate.com. If you're watching on YouTube, Check out the link in the description below. Vikings, Packers. Vikings at home, they're two-point dogs. This is one of one of the bigger games of the weekend. I think a lot of people will be focusing on Dallas Cowboys Chiefs, and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. I mean, that game's going to be freaking sick. But, man, Packers-Vikings in Minnesota will be a tight one. Right now, so far, 57% of the cash bet on this game is on Green Bay, and PFF loves Green Bay. And when PFF loves a favorite in this range, and it's on the road... I'm in, man. I'm buying Rodgers in a dome, fading the Kirk Cousins grade. I think this is a good opportunity to talk about Kirk Cousins grade. Right now, Kirk Cousins has the the highest PFF passing grade of any quarterback in the NFL. And for the fact that that is obviously baked into this green line algorithm and still seeing the Packers a favorite, I think speaks to why this Kirk grade is a bit inflated, right? Like the biggest thing that's driving his grade right now is not necessarily the high-end plays. He only ranks, he ranks inside the bottom 10 among starting quarterbacks in big-time throws. Why he's, and he'll, he has the third lowest average depth of target of any quarterback with at least 200 dropbacks this year. Accuracy is driving his grade far up while this offense only ranks 10th in EPA per pass. While the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers doesn't rank even in the top three, top four in PFF passing grade, but still leads a top seven passing attack. I do think that Green line, buying in it. Aaron Rodgers, better quarterback, only favored by two. Yeah, it's on the road, but it's in a dome. I, I do think I'm all in on Green Bay here. I am as well. All favorites. You're being, only betting favorites this week. Uh, yeah, only favorites. This is the week. This is the week that nothing crazy happens. This crazy shit's been happening. This is the week we actually comes back down to no. Uh, I do think that Garrett Bradbury likely coming back may be a good thing. Kenny Clark, career grade versus the Vikings, 90.4. The dude owns the Vikings. He'll be healthy in this one. That's, yeah, I, I like the Packers. Dolphins at Jets. This is a And it's wild. like, this is one's like, if the Vi- the Vikings, to have any chance, is a must win, though. I will, I will oh, say Oh, it's that. a must win. Yes. Or else they're out. I mean, they're four out. Of the... If they drop to four and six, curtains on the division. division. Dolphins at Jets. Jets are only three-point dogs at home. I mean, this is a market that is fading Miami at every opportunity, right? I mean, only three-point favorites over Joe Flacco and the New York Jets. Joe Flacco is expected to start over Mike White. Tua Tungavailoa is expected to start. They're not going to just have him on the bench until Jacoby Brissett gets hurt. 86% of the cash on this game has been bet on Miami. And I'm with the public here. Like, I like Miami minus three. Yeah, it's on the road, but it's the same coast. You're not traveling time zones there. Tua Tungavailoa is the better quarterback and way, way more than three points better than Flacco. And as bad as this Miami Dolphins team has performed, their talent is there. They are objectively more talented as a roster than the New York Jets, offensively and defensively. They just haven't, like, had a lot of cohesive, consistent success, a lot of that being at the quarterback position, and some of this being maybe the fact you, it's, so, it's hard to be cohesive when you have co-offensive coordinators and these different things. I think Miami is getting shit on because they haven't performed to expectation, but still, their talent is better. I like them as a better than a three-point favorite here. That's another favorite. I'm taking another favorite. Taking another favorite. I don't blame you. I am too. It's Flacco. This is my notes here. I just wrote it. It's Flacco. Like, you really expect me 
not me, Flacco, to beat this Brian Flores coach defense that we just saw last week. You, you expect that to happen with his supporting cast now. It's just, I don't think so. No, that, it's Flacco. <laughs> no, we're not happening. It's not going to happen. Before we get to Saints at Eagles, another sponsor here is it's Manscaped. Just launched new products, including their all-new ultra-premium body wash and a two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. It's time to give yourself or someone who needs it the gift of beautiful skin, hair, and balls this holiday season. Go to manscaped.com and use code PFF for 20% off plus free shipping. This week, we are giving away multiple performance packages 4.0s. Rate and review the podcast, leave your email, and we will choose winners at the end of the week. Tis the season to load up on Manscaped products, so get yourself, your dad, your brother, and your friends the best gift of all, the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. Get 20% off and free shipping with code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Clean up your nuts and make Santa proud this year. I think the Manscaped marketing department just gets in their fucking bag when they write these and like how can we fit in no. balls or nuts right yeah. i mean i don't they didn't even have like nuts roasting on open fire like i think they could have done better here but i like i like what they've done i like what they've done and i obviously love the product the lawnmower 4.0 keeps me keeps my snap game snapchat game up <laughs> all right saints at eagles I haven't gotten any of those snaps from me <laughs> you're due saints at eagles I'm going to give a pick on this game, Zip. but I'm not fucking betting this game. Oh. This game's disgusting. Saints and Eagles, you got Trevor Simeon, Jalen Hurts. It's a one and a half point spread in favor of the Eagles. And I don't like either side, really. I, mm-hmm. I think I'd lean Eagles over Simeon, but some of the, some of the reasons you like would maybe bet Saints is that like the run game has been so much of this Philadelphia Eagles offense of late. They rank number two in EPA per rush since week six. Over the past five weeks, they're the second most efficient rushing attack. Now, the Saints have the top run defense in EPA per rush allowed. Like they have been phenomenal against the run. They're also really good against the pass. Like this defense will be a tough beat for as good as Philly has been over the last five weeks. Now, where the tiebreaker is for me is the quarterback play, and I would put Jalen Hurts comfortably over Trevor Simeon. I like Eagles minus one and a half. Yes, that's another favorite. But again, I'm not telling you to bet this game. I like Eagles minus one and a half. So it's every favorite. I believe they've turned a corner to a degree offensively. And it's because of this. Their neutral pass rate weeks one through five was 59.8%. That's top five in the NFL. We said, with Jalen Hurts at the helm, how you win, and with that offensive line, how you win is through the option game. Like through utilizing the fact that teams, like forcing teams to account for the run first. And early in the season, they were just saying, hey, we're gonna we're gonna try to make Jalen Hurts pass. We're like, that's where we butter our bread the last five weeks so 59.8 percent the first five weeks last five weeks 39.8 percent second lowest in the nfl they have been grinding on the ground miles sanders hopefully hopeful to play in this game apparently i believe even new, even if not i still think that the eagles have more than enough i like their new approach to offense and i think they win by more than one and a half i'm on another favorite for this next game I, we need we need help we need we need something to you stop. Do. Football team at Panthers. Panthers are favored by three and a half. And I am buying. I'm all in. I'm pushing chips behind the Cam Newton, P.J. Walker mix. And Christian McCaffrey had a big impact in their last game as well. Like a lot of the focus was on Cam and he's back. And that's, you know, that thing that was probably shared a thousand times. But Christian McCaffrey also played well in that game. P.J. Walker played above expectation. It was against a good, or that has been a good Cardinals defense, right? And like the football team, Chase Young not playing in this game, obviously, out with the torn mm-hmm. ACL. Football team probably at the top of the market since they've, you know, coming off, not the top of the market, but coming off a good game against the Bucks and still a three and a half point dog. I, I think I like Carolina, maybe not to blow out this line, but I like them by four plus. And uh, if this line gets to three, say people start betting football team, I think I'd still lean into Carolina down the stretch. I am picking a dog here. I'm picking oh, wow. football team three and a half is too much for a team with a backup quarterback that has their own issues in their own right like they are not a good offensive line and even without chase young this is still a damn good defensive line the guy that doesn't get talked about enough who might be who has kind of joined that tier of defensive tackles behind aaron donald that can impact any game and expect and take over if they have a favorable matchup is jonathan allen 91.1 pass rushing grade this year the dude has been been utterly dominant dominating ali marpet last weekend a big reason they won that game and he ain't going up against Ali Marpet. He's going up against scrubs on this Carolina offensive line on the interior backups. 
this is going to be that's that's the matchup to me that decides this game. Three and a half points for a team that has a shaky offensive line with a backup quarterback. Too much for me. PJ Walker's no backup quarterback. Okay. <laughs> Sam Darnold. Was I was gonna backup. say, even if it was Sam Darnold, I'd still say that. <laughs> like it's still it's a, I think this is my first dog, potentially. 49ers have been so successful running the football. I mean, over the past five weeks, they're the second most efficient rushing offense. Now, the Jags haven't been that terrible defending the run, and some of that has been they've been getting. It's been so easy to pass on the Jacksonville Jaguars <laughs> and beat them through the air. I think that the 49ers maybe shift their game plan a bit and lean on things after the catch, lean on Devo Samuel, Ayuk, Kittle to get things going through the air because this ground defense has been ground defense. This run defense for the Jags has been good. Now, what I could see happening though, maybe I do take the 49ers on the road at minus six and a half. But this number could get to seven or even seven and a half. And I think you take the Jags if you get the hook for the banter alone, for rooting Urban Meyer at home. I, I, I think you do it. And I think the Niners are so, so, so valued highly right now because they're coming off a big win in prime time over the Los Angeles Rams. I think that'll get baked into the second half of the week number. I think you'll see this get to seven, seven and a half. And at that point, let's take the Jags and root for Slurbin. Yeah, I'm taking the Jags here. And now they burn me a lot this year. They have. The 49ers have covered this number of six and a half twice all year. They are not, they are a flawed football team. Like, and especially, or should be, on the defensive side of the ball. Like, the Jags should be able to at least score some points. And six and a half, like, the 49ers offense has been so inconsistent this year. Lest we forget two weeks ago, they got blown out by the Cardinals with Colt McCoy at quarterback. Like, on the road, across the country, for a 1 p.m. game, Give me the Jags. That's a tough. Like that's the thing, right? Like going cross. Yeah. Cross the time zones there. Crossing the that time. That might zones. be. Okay, I'm an idiot. No, Miami would be their farthest game that they'd have to travel. But like that's a very long. It is a distance, and it's meaningful. This game right here, this next one I'm gonna bring up. 4 p.m. slate, kicking us off. Yeah. It's fucking disrespectful. Raiders are oh. a one point dog at home against the Bengals, and yeah, I know they got their ass blown out by the Chiefs. Mahomes ain't walking through that door. This is Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals. I think the Raiders bounce back, honestly. Like, if that game's close, I think this is Raiders by three. Like, Raiders mi minus three. And they haven't played well of late, and they've been still trying to figure out how do they replace Henry Ruggs in this offense. And Derek Carr has been spotty, inconsistent compared to the start of the season. But, man, this Bengals team going to Las Vegas, traveling to the West. I like Derek Carr over Joe Burrow right now. And, like, that better quarterback getting points at home. Feed me Derek Carr and the Las Vegas Raiders. I think that's a dog, by the way. I think the no Henry Ruggs is a real thing for this offense. The no, uh, no one's saying it's not a real thing. Vertical. I'm saying just like they were an explosive offense early in the season. Last two weeks, 16 points, 14 points. Have not had that same level of explosion. And it's like Brian Edwards all of a sudden gets featured in this offense. Brian Edwards can't separate, save his life. He is a contest catch only kind of guy. So. Yeah, I, and, and I do not trust this Raiders defense as much as I like their pass rush. I think they get home to Joe Burrow. I think Joe Burrow does a good job of protecting himself to a degree with getting the ball out of his hands. I like the Bengals in this one. Yeah, the Bengals are going to have to get the ball out quick. And, and I think – I'm not saying this Raiders team is flawed. You know, we saw that mm -hmm. loud and clear against the Kansas City Chiefs. But – one point spread at home. I, I'm fading the Bengals this week, and Quinn's probably going to be all about it. No, I got. I, I have a legit question. So we specifically we at PFF have talked about how like Max Crosby is as productive as he is because of the right tackles that he's faced this year. Mm -hmm. Like he's gotten lucky. Yeah. Is Riley Reef maybe the best right tackle? That's he's a good point. Actually, that's a good point. It probably is. I would also argue too, though, because we've paid such close attention to Max Crosby all season. I think he's getting better as the season progresses too. Like this guy is like legitimately improving, and they, I think more teams are catching on that he's this good. And I think he's getting better and getting home. I think that game against Wiley, former Eastern Michigan teammate, he's getting held a lot. Still had 13 pressures in that game. They're game planning against Crosby more and more, and still he's improving. I still think Crosby gets home against Reef, even though I would agree. I think Reef probably is one of the best tackles he's seen this year. And, I, you know, every time I fade the Bengals, the Bengals end up dump trucking me. But maybe this is my homerism. I like the Raiders, man. I like the Raiders here. I think they're getting overfaded, overfaded. You got to stick with your homerism. I'm sticking home this, this is legit. This is no legit. qualms for me. <laughs> <laughs> Cowboys at Chiefs. I was just looking through. I'm pretty sure that he would qualify. Although, actually, wait, no. Lane Johnson, he did face. Oh, that's true. So, second best right tackle he's faced. Probably the game of the weekend, Cowboys at Chiefs. Mm -hmm. 
man, Chiefs favored by two and a half at home. And I can't find a side where I pick Kansas City. I like Dallas in this game. Their defense is playing well. And yeah, you know, Dan Quinn runs a lot more single high shit, just like Gus Bradley. I still think that they see what happened to the Raiders in primetime and they refuse. They refuse to make the same mistake, right? I think they continue to throw two high safeties at Patrick Holmes, limit the big play, force them to run the football. And offensively, I mean, this Dallas Cowboys offense is on fire. Dak Prescott's on fire. I like the Cowboys as two and a half point dogs at home. I like the money line too. I think Dallas wins this one. This one's tough. Uh, I I can see arguments for both sides. I think a big part of, like you said, the Cowboys defense is playing better. So it's the Chiefs defensive late. And now, yeah, they go up against some, you know, they go up against backup quarterback a couple weeks ago in Jordan Love. Um, but they, you know, they looked good or better against the Raiders last week. But I think the biggest reason for that is their defensive line has gotten a pass rush. They've actually impacted opposing quarterbacks. Chris Jones had a monster game on the interior. I don't think that's happening against this Cowboys line. And yeah, Tyron Smith may or may not play, but if Tyron Smith does play in this game, they're not getting pressure on deck. And if you're talking to me about an offensive line that or one quarterback that I know is not going to be pressured in this game against that Chiefs defense, I'm taking that one. Because yeah. I think they at least, you know, Michael Parsons on a blitz can get to Patrick Mahomes. I, I do, do not foresee if this offensive line is fully healthy, the Chiefs being able to get to. Dak Prescott. Before we get to Cardinals, Seahawks, Steelers, Chargers, and Giants, Buck Bucks. Another sponsor has to shout out is West or is DraftKings. Football fans who's ready to score some free bets now you can with when you bet on any NFL game this week with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers who bet just one dollar on either team to score one hundred dollars in free bets. When a team scores, you score. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, DraftKings won't leave you empty-handed. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contest. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. Bet $1 on either team to score and win $100 in free bets. If you, if they score, you score with promo code PFF this week at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 years or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required. One for customer restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem call 1-800-GAMBLER. Cardinals at Seahawks. This line is too low if Kyler Murray's playing. Kyler Murray on the road in Seattle, I think would cover this two and a half, if not significantly. I think they could win by seven plus if Kyler plays. Now, you're still waiting to see if he's going to come back from injury. I think that's baked into this line a bit. But if this line stays at two and a half, three, I take Cardinals by three uh, with Kyler. Yeah, I think it has to be. So it's Cardinals favored by two and a half. I think yeah. it has to be them expecting him not to play, right? Like that is crazy if he is healthy. And I get that they're on the road in Seattle, but Seattle's not a good team. I mean, like flat out, both sides of the ball, they have issues. I, I uh, obviously like injury massive here, but if it just stays two and a half, Kyler plays. I don't, I don't understand. Like, yeah, take the Cardinals. Yeah. Steelers at Chargers. The Chargers should be six point favorites in this game. It should be six point favorites in this game, but they have not like because of the talent, because of how good Justin Herbert plays. I think he's the top five graded quarterback according to PFF so far this year. The talent they have on defense, Staley, all this stuff, but like, they have not been playing up to their talent level, in my opinion. And a lot of that we've had that conversation about Joe Lombardi and that low average depth target for Justin Herbert. I don't think that shows up against Pittsburgh here. And yeah, they're at home, but if Big Ben can play, which I think they're still weighing right now, will mm -hmm. he play? We'll see. If Big Ben pl does play, I think this is a plus six situation I like. I think the Chargers still probably win, especially since it is at home and Steelers are making a pretty decent trip there. But I don't think the Chargers have been playing up to what they should be six point favorites. Yeah, I, I like the Steelers here. I'm not even sure I need Big Ben to play. I just think this defense is so good. Like the, I, the way the Chargers have been operating offensively, I, I just worry about them being able, to put it, being able to put points on the scoreboard. And so. Yeah, I don't love the Steelers to light it up either, but 13, 16 points like they scored last week, I think that's enough to cover a six-point spread. Last game on the Week 11 slate here. Bucks favored by 11. And I've talked about the Bucks as my favorite team in the NFL. Not my favorite, but the best team in the NFL. But 11 points, in my opinion, with how bad Brady has looked of late, is too much. And I'm going to just I'm gonna look at the camera here. Tom, Tom Brady shocked me here because I'm taking Giants plus 11. 
shock me because I don't think you have played 11 points favorites here. I don't think they deserve that. Their defense hasn't played up to that level either. Bottom 10 in efficiency, both offensively and defensively over the past three, four weeks. This Giants team isn't good, but I don't think they're 11-point bad. And it's on the road, but still, I like the Giants. I, think the, I like the Giants defensively. Like, defensively, to at least give Tom Brady and these receivers some problems. Like, they have guys who can match up one-on-one -on -one at times. Like, they're not going to get absolutely gashed, I don't believe. I mean, 16 points to the Raiders a couple weeks ago, 20 points to the Chiefs, 3 points to the Panthers the week before that. Like, that, this is a talented all-around defense that can... I think creates some issues. Like, I, or not create some issues, but like at least hold their own and go matchup for matchup in this Bucks game to where 11 points is huge. It's just that's a huge spread for a team coming off a bye in New York. So, yeah, give me the Giants to cover that. Love it, love it. Like, Shall you we about get it? me about like Bucks get 11 against the Giants when the Texans are only 10 against the Titans? Titans top of the AFC. Ah. I just don't see it. I just don't see it. These lines. That's, man, not, my whole, that's lines not the whole. That's not the hold your nose. That's not the hold your nose. <laughs> the week. Shall we get to the mailbag? Mm -hmm. Joe Binner on Twitter. Make sure if you do want to get on the mailbag, rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Leave a question there, and you'll be moved top of the list. Now, you can also ask on Twitter if you follow us or PFF underscore Tailgate on Twitter. You can send a DM there, and that'll also get you on the mailbag episode. In draft season, we usually do two mailbag episodes a week bonus mailbag and all that stuff so should be a good time there john binner on twitter love the pod if you guys ever do a rutgers tailgate let's get after it a couple giants questions how early is too early to draft linderbaum what is that's tyler linderbaum the center for iowa what is the dream scenario and most realistic scenario for the giants two draft picks barring they don't trade them they have two top 12 picks my dream is Kayvon thibodeau and tyler linderbaum more realistic than or, or more realistic route Aiden Hutchinson, and Nick Abiquanu. So he wants to go D-line, O-line. He wants it. But I think the Giants should be O-line and edge with their first three picks strictly unless they can fan trade partners and get future assets in a pretty deep draft class. Yeah, I mean, that's where the strength of this class is. We said edge is edge preloaded. And so I think taking advantage of that, especially at the top, as we've said, NFL is pretty good at identifying the guys at the top of the draft when are edge rushers, when it's like a guy who's productive in college and is a lead athlete. That is Aiden Hutchinson to me. So I think that would be a nice consolation prize if you can't end up with them wherever you are. And then Tyler Linderbaum is who I would like found the Giants to kind of bring stability to that offensive line, a center that you know you can count on for however long he's going to be there. That would go a long way towards fixing this offensive line. So that would be my dream. It's a good, and you know, Linderbaum. John Benner, it's a good year to want edge and offensive line, right? I mean, it's a good year. If that's yeah. what you want for the Giants, this class yeah. is loaded. Dom T. Corbett on Twitter. Hey guys, I got a mailbag question. With the state of this quarterback class being as up in the air as it is currently, is this not actually a golden opportunity for a team drafting outside the top 10 to snag a franchise quarterback? Obviously more luck into it than usual, but if I'm a GM of the Broncos, Panthers, Steelers, Colts, etc., I'm holding my nose and taking it. I kind of agree, right? Like I, I think we've yeah. had that conversation a bit. It's like, hey, this it, if you are picking in that 12 or like 10 to 32 range in the first round, you have needs or opportunities to upgrade at that position. Just because the quarterback class in the upper air doesn't mean these guys aren't talented, right? It doesn't mean just because they're maybe not worth top 10 picks because there's other blue chip talent along the offensive line or edge or whatever doesn't mean if you're in a position where your quarterback class your quarterback right now is not solidified as a top 10 top 12 guy it doesn't mean you can't make an upgrade choice yeah we could very well not see one go in the top five picks but still see four or five honestly go in the first round and so like if you are new orleans you know you are pittsburgh who are teams who season ends right now they're in the playoffs they're gonna be picking in the 20s I would go and get. I would, this would be a nice class to be like. Hey, I'll take it. I'll take a chance on you know, Sam Howell comes out. I'll take a chance on maybe like Carson Strong, Kenny Pickett. Like I think that's going to happen in this upcoming draft. I'm excited, man. I think this uh, this quarterback class, as much as it is up in the air, I think it is a lot of talented guys, and it would be interesting to see how all these guys ultimately fit in. All right, ja Jagir Johal on Twitter. One thing I've always wondered: when a team is up one, gets a touchdown, and just kicks the field goal or the PAT to go right knowing if the other team scores, they're probably going to get the two as well. Why not just try and ice by going up two? I feel like the odds of converting are high, and at worst, a touchdown just ties it. That's his first question. Okay. So if so you're saying, the, the, to spell it out, saying when you go up seven points and you have a chance of either kicking an extra point or going for two, 
why not just go for two to go up nine? Um, if, if you see your success rate, like, I don't know, your historic success rate, if you believe it's above 50%, you know, by all means, because mm-hmm. that means like, uh, it depends on, you know, are you a good offensive team or a good defensive team? Good defensive team, you probably means you're limiting their success rate to under 50%. If you're a bad offensive team, probably means you're under 50% yourself. So that's obviously something to weigh in. But then there's also the induced urgency of that we've talked about. An eight-point game is really a one-and-a-half-point game. Like, mm-hmm. it's difficult. So teams will, when they're down eight points, they will act as if they're down one score so that they will play to, you know, score that touchdown with – 30 seconds left, 20 yeah. seconds left. Whereas if they're down nine, they're going to play a different game to try to... They're going to try and get down there quick. two scores. Yep. So that plays against you if you do go up nine to where they are going faster and could have the chance to win still in regulation. But Second second question from Ye- Jaeger. Yeah. What do you value more when putting together a roster? Rounding it out, like adding a second DT or a linebacker or three receivers, or creating depth at the positions that are most important, so getting a third edge or tackle or fourth corner? So depth, I'm not too – I don't want to say I'm not too worried about, but, like, you want guys to see the field. And I've always said that about, like, first, second-round picks. Your first, second-round pick should have a path to the field. You don't want guys who are literal backups. So if a backup tackle, yeah, obviously injuries happen and the guy usually plays. But, like, at cornerback, your third cornerback, fourth cornerback, those guys see the field. At wide receiver, your fourth wide receiver sees the field. Like, there are certain positions where guys will see the field. Certain positions they don't, like backup quarterback. Like, if you draft back quarterback, guy's just not ever going to see the football field. So I lean towards roster management, building out a roster, making a unit as dominant as possible, like putting resources to, if you're going to build around a defensive line, that's where you allocate your resources and then you can kind of smooth it out in the secondary, whatever. But I think like the Browns, it's like we got the best offense line in the NFL where if like you want the best wide receiving core in the NFL, put your resources there. And then it's, it makes schematically scheming up the rest of the stuff easier to be dominant on one unit that you can rely on week in and week out. Question three from Jaeger. Is Brock Bowers, the Georgia tight end, the best tight end in college football? No, it's Michael Mayer. Uh, you knew where this one was going. Notre Dame tight end. He's the best. All, all, so Brock Bowers is a, guy, is a goddamn glorified wide receiver at this point. The dude's 230. He's an H-back. Um, He's good. I'm not denying that. True freshman. He's going to be a dude in time, but he is not a tight end. Michael Mayer, on the other hand, is. I still... You're Michael Mayer. Shit. Brock Bowers. Call him Brock Bowers a glorified tight end. I mean, glorified wide receiver. receiver. Well, yeah, he is. Disrespect. Okay. Eastside Zach on Twitter said, I would like to hear you guys' opinion on Michigan's other draft prospects, especially David Ajabo. He feel, I feel he kind of gets overlooked playing opposite Aiden Hutchinson. He's not getting overlooked anymore. Yeah. A lot of people we see this guy as the top yeah. 20 guys. We talked about Ajabo on the Wednesday episode. Ajabo is where on your big board right now? Oof. I mean, big newest big board update, he's going to be a top 25 player. Mm-hmm. He's been, like I said, he, he might end up in the top three or four edges in this class like that's the kind of tools we're working with and just straight up shit how he's played of late on to c sports bros on twitter what is our halfway all rookie team that's on pff.com Go to pff.com baby who was on it who are some of the names on the pff all rookie team halfway mac jones jamar chase jamar chase jamar chase jalen waddle i'll read off the list here first team only mac jones khalil herbert Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, Rondell Moore in the slot, Kyle Pitts at tight end, Rashawn Slater, Elijah Vera Tucker, Creed Humphrey, Trey Smith, and Sam Cosby. Two Chiefs men. Chiefs men? <laughs> Two Kansas City Chiefs making the offensive line for all rookie offensive line. Defensive tackle Roy Lopez for the Houston Texans in what was not a great defensive tackle that class. And then also Christian Barmore for the New England Patriots on edge, Quiddy Pay, Greg Rousseau. Linebackers, Wusu Cormo and Michael Parsons. Corners were Newsom and Asante Samuel Jr. with the slot being Nate Hobbs, who's been one of the highest grade rookies this year. And then the two safeties, Trayvon Merrick and Javon Holland, who I still believe are the two highest graded rookie safeties, even after a little bit after the midway season. Biggest miss on the rookie class so far, is it Mac Jones? You brought, you brought up Mac Jones and said it was a whiff watch. Is Mac Jones the biggest miss of this rookie class so far? No, I think the biggest miss for me would be uh, Creed Humphrey. He was... 
and now truthfully he was actually so like mac jones was ahead of on the pff draft board before he actually went his 14th on the pff draft board goes 15th creed humphrey was like three spots ahead on the pff draft board where he goes at 63rd but to not recognize a guy who comes in as the highest grade center in the nfl is just that's a whiff like that was i'm embarrassed about that i feel good about you know our track record on the offensive line and to be to be hesitant about creed humphrey enough to say you know he's probably more of a second round type of guy or day two type of guy where he fell in the pff draft board embarrassing also sam cosme i i just i didn't exp- i should have bought into it better like he was so and uh, again actually he was actually on the pff draft board where he went but like he has been damn good when healthy and was such a freak athlete that it's like he was going to figure it out and, and he was still good in pass direction he like got by I just, I think I was burned by Jason Spriggs by being high on him coming out. And I just saw a lot of the same stuff in Cosby. And Cosby's really not been Jason Spriggs, I'll just say. Humphrey, too. I mean, he, I think the stat is his rookie grade, weeks one through 10, is the highest we've ever seen from a center. And the number two center on that list is Nick Mangold, the New York Jets back in 2006. He has been phenomenal. Biggest hit on the rookie class so far. I mean, we, we said Micah Parsons. A lot of people were doubting Micah Parsons. We said, like, this guy's just a monster. Like, a, he is a different dude at linebacker than you'll see and has really transformed that Cowboys defense in a number of ways. Jeremiah was Koromoa, super high on him. Now, obviously, didn't fall because of purely on the field, but to go in the second round and have, I think he's second still in pass breakups among rookies. And then Greg Newsom as well. Like, in terms of just pure performance among this rookie cornerback class, he's right there with Patrick Chetan and J.C. Horn when they were on the football field. He is statistically, grade-wise, right there, and that's kind of what we said of him coming out, 26th overall pick. We're like, he's closer to that tier one of cornerbacks than people are giving him credit for, or where he ended up getting drafted. I think some of the other relative hits, too, and obviously it's early, calling anything like a, a, a no, no one's taken victory laps yet, but Quiddy yeah. Pay has played really well, and we had him as our edge one. Yeah, it's been the best rookie edge and he is and then i would also add like trayvon merrick like i think we were higher on trayvon merrick even the nfl was and he has been not only playing really well and grading really well but he's also like played a ton like he's been asked to do so much in that single high defense and he's exceeded expectations for them as well all right this is from the glaze train aka (laughs) i won't say it um for chicago bears do you think that a total restructure for the front office is in order ted phillips is a president but has no football background and needs to be replaced with a president of football operations ryan pace while successful in the later rounds continually misses in the top 100 picks of the draft he also let his saints background show by continually trading up instead of back and creating cap chaos by restructuring deals to the future creating problems in the near future matt Nagy has shown he can't call an offense to fit the skill sets of players to maximize the team's opportunities. Do you think a president of football ops, new GM, coach, the trio needs to be new to unlock the full potential of Justin Fields that, 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 for, the, for the franchise? Yeah, I think you said it there with the, the Saints background continuing to show because that has been his approach when they are not the Saints. You know, they don't have the talent base that the Saints do. And so... I was saying, I said this going into last year's draft, that you're giving them the keys to a massively impactful draft, to a massively impactful position like quarterback, which they go up and get. And I didn't disagree with that. But then he can't help himself in the second round and trades up for Tevin Jenkins. They're just not going to have picks now. Like they mortgage a lot of the future to get Justin Fields. And we're super high on Justin Fields. Don't disagree with that. But then don't trade up again to just get one offensive tackle. When, like I just said, the guy who was picked... 14, 12 picks after Tevin Jenkins, Sam Cosme is balling. Like there was that group of tackles there, yeah. off the tackles there that Tevin Jenkins be wasn't appreciably better than. And so you're giving up more draft capital. You don't have a ton. You have an expensive roster. You're literally having to cut starting cornerbacks, starting offensive tackles because you put yourself in this situation to where it's difficult. I, 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 I can't call for people's jobs, but I just it's difficult for me to see them all surviving this season. Who do you think is a good fit? Say they do move on from Nagy. Uh, is it Dable? Is it Joe Brady? Those I think it would be, be an attractive job. Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I mean, with, with Justin Fields, Fields, it's got to be attractive. I think it'll be an attractive job. People will want to go there. I, although I will say, I'm not sure if you are a, you know, you're a, you're an upcoming head coach. Do you, do you want to necessarily be 100% tied to a guy's success? I will, like, are you, if Justin Fields then plays like shit next year, like you're kind of, 
tied to him. Plus, Allen years. Robinson's a free agent, but, and they don't have a lot of draft capital. I mean, it's, but I do think it'll be a attractive job, and, and I think he'll. Well, obviously, we're high on him, so I think he'll be a, a good NFL quarterback um, and attract other offensive coordinators. And it will be a thing where they, you will have this excuse, or I guess the actual excuse of we didn't draft him. You know, you yeah. gave him to me. Whatever head coach comes in. This is from JC 1995 on Apple Podcasts. Help me understand why Sam Howell isn't the clear QB2 in this class. If not the QB1, I see a prospect with three years of produ- great production, a true freshman freshman breakout in the ACC, translatable NFL tools with his big arm, beautiful deep ball, and running ability, two years younger than Pickett and Corral, a year younger than Willis and Ritter. Even in his down year, his metrics aren't much worse than last year and seems easily explained by poor weapons and crap show of an offensive line. To me... That's a kid who's proven it against good competition for three years, did so as a young player, and has all the NFL tools. Not to mention he's tough as nails. Did you see some of the shots he took against Pitt? Why is he not more in the discussion for analyst QB1? Thanks, fellas. I think people want to see upward trajectory when projecting to the draft. You don't want don't want to draft a guy who's already regressing in certain areas. That's whatever the excuse or whatever the reason for such – if it is you know talent around him, which, I mean – Josh Downs pretty damn good wide receiver. It's not like it's untenable talent around him. This isn't Daniel Jones at Duke, but you want to see continued upward progression. So for him to take steps back in certain areas, I think the biggest worry being pocket presence, like under pressure grade, 52.3 passer grade under pressure this year, 30.8% pressure to sack conversion rate, which is insanely high for a quarterback. That's, I think that was higher than Justin Fields even was, and that was one of the things Fields got killed for. He has been... A one and run quarterback this year. First read, not there. Breaks pocket, tries to do something with his legs. And it's like some of that's the offense that he's in, but that is not that's that doesn't fly in the NFL. That is not what you want to see as an evaluator. So I think that's why is that it's just going to be a curve, a steep curve for him. And the tools are there. Hell yeah, like they're there. He's accurate. I I, I still would love to draft him somewhere in the first round at the back end, but you just he's a project at this point that's my take on sam hell for sure about the last thing you said like i i i'm not letting this guy go to the second round mm-hmm. you know sam howell has more than enough to build around and develop to be a first round caliber quarterback prospect and i think when you brought, talk about the one and run and that kind of shit it's like in the right offense i think he can improve and and having talked to him on this podcast i feel confident in him you know i, I hate to have that bias but i do think that you brought up an excel spreadsheet and you came in your caked pants i did i just caked i just caked but he didn't bring up the excel spreadsheet but i think that the supporting cast has obviously had a drop off and that offense is very collegey right and i think you know you only get to see what he's in i think if he going to the nfl he let this guy go to the second round i think it'd be ridiculous i think that would be ridiculous he brought up an excel spreadsheet that means he's a nerd and again do you like we've had this conversation before do you want to nourish your quarterback no no, no. i don't think you do you think quinn brings up good points i'm i'm sorry jeff mcsee on apple podcasts uh, unfortunately, I'm a 49ers fan, and the team is an utter disappointment. Assuming Shanahan finds a way to avoid losing his job and gets to play design, gets to play design for Trey Lance offense going forward. One, do you sign Golden Domer Mike McGlinchey at right tackle despite his mediocre pass blocking and the injury? Do the change in offensive scheme? Answer that one first. Do you go after McGlinch? I don't think so, honestly. Because so he has his fifth year option next year. That's locked in. Um, but then after that, you're just – he would have to turn things around from a pass protection perspective for me to really go after him because I think he's going to covet a massive deal on the open market or would covet a massive deal. And just be a uh, pedigree. You know, like guys who are drafted highly, who play well, even if they're not elite, get big contracts. Especially that's just position. how it goes. So it's going to be a ton of money to a team that's already paying Trent Williams a ton of money and now – Trevor Williams obviously getting up there in age and it's not a long-term deal, but that's a lot to commit to two tackles when they truthfully can get by to a degree without them in that offense. Second question, do you develop Jalen Moore? I mean, hope to. I wasn't super high on him coming out. He was the Western Michigan tackle. Uh, physical tools-wise, has, has developmental tools. That's, you know, fifth rounder. That's where you get, but... Yeah, I mean, do you develop them? Sure, you fucking want to. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> That's like, I, 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 would, like a I, would go, I would want to add to that position. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
draft draft a guy in the second and pray they don't find another mediocre player like they love, like Aaron Banks. That was the mistake. I still don't know what that pick at the time. I was like, what the f- what was that? Like it just made no sense to me. Um, they took him 48th overall, ahead of aforementioned Sam Cosme, a little D- Dylan Radens, ahead of Creed Humphrey, and it was just like he he was the fourth best guy in Notre Dame's line last year. That was weird. That one was always weird to me. Last, and now I can't see the field. Yeah, I mean, yeah. all right, Joko Ball, Apple Podcast. There's been no light at the end of the tunnel for USF since 2017 with Quinton Flowers. We're getting a USF question here. I know. Are there any prospects on USF to keep an eye on? Bengals legend Quentin Flowers. Uh, what was a Bengals legend? Honestly, like, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I went through the roster and I was just... There was, like, Xavier Weaver is their top wide receiver. He's a stick. He's not, not going to play in the league. The left tackle, Donovan Jennings, their best offensive lineman. The dude... He'd be a guard at the next level, and he could barely move. So those are your options. Yikes! Yikes! Joko so. Bob, sorry, <laughs> hate to see that. Wandy four one two. Still the no last light. one Still before no trivia. Who are your best prospects from Texas? I mean, it's gonna be Bijan. Bijan's a dude, obviously, but upcoming, Demarvion Overshone and Tavondre Sweat may declare. So Demarvion Overshone, the linebacker. Super skinny though, still for a linebacker. He's kind of that hybrid. He was a safety, switch linebackers like 6'4, 220. Still struggles m- mightily as a tackler. I, I He may even come back to school. Tavondre Sweat, similarly, just kind of a one trick nose that that's like a day three yeah. guy nowadays where I, I would be surprised if he also, he does, he could come back to school. He's a true junior himself. Quinn, before we get to trivia, Shouting out Western and Southern, a proud sponsor of the Tailgate Podcast. Whether it's football success or financial savvy, the right questions help set the stage for winning strategies. Western and Southern is teaming up with PFF's very own Chris Collinsworth to share insights that can help put you ahead of both your fantasy and financial scoreboards. Want to hear about Chris's old playing days or behind the scenes with Alan Sunday Night Football? How about a need to know for your financial future? Now you can ask about either or both. And every football or financial question you ask earns you a chance to win a catered party for February's big game. Check out the Chris Collinsworth Podcast and Western Southern's Instagram for answers to the best questions each week submit your questions at westernsouthern.com slash ask chris one more time that is westernsouthern.com slash ask chris if you're watching on youtube check out the link in the description below remember with western southern you can rest assured on game day quinn trivia season that's it yep let's do it question number one is from perk angel on twitter mm. uh yeah yeah he says Kayvon thibodeau is the projected first overall pick in the 22 NFL draft. He would become the fourth Oregon defensive player to be selected in the first round since 2010. Who are the other three? Marcus Mariota. Oregon defensive player? Defensive players, oh. yeah. Okay, since, two, since 2010. Since 2010, yep. So who are the other three? Oregon? DeForest Buckner. Defo. Yep, Defo. Uh, Deion Jordan. Yep. And it's a good... Twenty fifteen. Oh no, no. You can yell it out. We're not getting penalized. I for thought wrong it was that guy. Here. Remember they had that corner. It's like Efo something. Oh but yeah, he had nah, it's, hurt. it's yeah. not a corner. That was that was like they had Troy Hill and D line. The guy um, D line, another defensive lineman. Deion uh, Jordan, DeForest this. Buckner. Oh, are we gone? Oh, Rick, 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 yep, you got it. Nailed it. Uh, number two. This one's a little bit tougher. This season, Oklahoma became the second school to have two number one overall picks at quarterback face each other in the NFL with Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. What school had the first? Two number one overall picks face each other. I'll give you a hint. It's two quarterbacks. I like that. I like that. Back in the day. Back Back in the the day? day? Fuck. Uh, Where'd John Elway go to school? Stanford. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm out. Let me think. I'll, I'll think. I'll say. How far back in the day do we have like a uh, range? 1971 and 1983. Oh man. Okay. No. Uh, shit. I'll say. Oh, what do I gotta say? Alabama. 
You're, you're thinking yeah. too hard. Austin said it. It's Stanford. It is Stanford. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Jim Plunkett and John Elway. Oh, oh it was. Yeah. yeah. I, was, I, I couldn't think of another Stanford quarterback. Yeah. That was the problem. I, that's, that's going way back. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess Jim Plunkett's a big name. Um, last one. Name the last Heisman Trophy winning QB who was not a first-round pick. Oh, did we ask this one last week? I think we might have asked this one before. Yeah, I thought we did. Well, the answer is still the same. It has not changed. <laughs> who's not a first? Round I can't pick. remember who it was. I think it was last week. Who's not a first round pick? Uh, no, that was just any first round pick. That was not. And it was Derrick Henry. Oh, but okay. Quarterback Troy Smith. Yeah, Troy Smith. Nice. Two thousand seven. Nice. I also, that's it for trivia. But I do have um, one more thing. Let me pull this up here. Uh, so last, I can't remember. Was it last Thursday? We were talking about the like safeties that kind of move all like the jamal adams type player that moves and we were trying to think of a name for him so mitchell may 33 on twitter says jack would be a good one as in jack of all trades i like jack i like that too that's it's kind of like middle linebackers the mic jack like the guy that's moving all over formation yeah yeah that's a term for like the so does nickel though yeah i I like like jack Jack. i like jack yeah we'll stick with that jack it is that's it. That's all I got. I got to know your co-host. What was my go-to Mexican restaurant at San Diego State? Bonus, what did I order? Oscars. It's called Trujillo's, and you got the Sigma Chi Crunch Wrap. It was fire. Wow. I definitely had a chance of knowing that. <laughs> I've said it before. Have you? Maybe. Did you have one? Oscars was fire, though, in San Diego. The, the yeah, Oscars tacos. was fire. Um, yeah, I had one. What was my favorite sport growing up that I quit before high school because my brother quit baseball nope you said you were going to pitch for harvard or some shit right <laughs> uh, I was it golf it was golf wow i my i used to play all the time with my brother it would and i would never play without my brother he's two years older than me and we would always just go in the summer and play together he i'm gonna put him on blaster he goes to state freshman year state golf oh, it's no. dead last place in state oh my god what Quits. a trash fire <gasps> quit what a Just loser. Quick golf. And so I had no one to play with. So you quit. And we were like small town. So I quit. Wow, your brother just cost us Tiger Woods. Pretty much. I mean, <laughs> that is kind of how golf no, he was, is. Though. He was better than me. Like, if you don't, I, I mean, I guess if you're like a diehard golfer, it's one thing, but like, you got to have a good crew to golf with. Exactly. Or else it's not as fun. I mean, going out and doing it alone or going out on yourself by yourself and trying to like practice golf is a fucking, it's a grind. Like, I tried and I was just like, nah, I got to quit. Like, I was I, friends I with a, like a, go a San Diego State golfer and like their, like your mental focus is just like unreal. Like, what you have to do yeah. to like go through, like, to be that good across like hours is insane like full it, days they could go full days and be a focus it's yeah because it's like if you go out and play around you're not really practicing like you're not getting better mm-hmm. it's, it's more just like doing drills where like if you go out and play basketball you get better by just playing the sport golf you you just have to drill like it's just like one swing chip chip My gosh. chip chip, chip. It sounds awful or you just grind. go yug a bunch of beers with the buddies and and then yeah hit some balls yug like season. that's how you don't make the tour though that's going to do it for the Thursday episode of Tailgate. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, Tailgate.